Okay, um, I was looking up the three stages that Jesse Biok has uh, uh, identified, and this would be the first phase would be <clears throat> colonization. Which would be from the beginning, which what was what did we say it was beginning eight thirties or so, eight seventies to about nine thirty. Um, okay, and, and here he says they they set up a decentralized society with limited stratification so that uh, reciprocity among farmers and chieftains was essential. Especially important were the ties of mutual obligation between the chieftains and their acknowledged followers. Okay, the second of the three phases of the three free states development was characterized by stability. And so this would be beginning in the 10th century with the end of the... So, so his second phase um, would begin in 930, and this would be... Um, stability. Okay, he's using different norms than um, Gwyn Jones is. And this is a long phase that so continued into the 12th century. Um, and uh, here the sagas depict rivalry and competition among chieftains and farmers. We see the lives and ambitions of small farmers something offered by few other medieval European narratives. So here he's praising the sagas as a source. And then he says the third phase, so this would be one, two, three here, and one, two, and the third phase that he identifies is <clears throat> the appearance of a new elite, and now we have the um, stability of lots of small chieftains replaced by only a few big chieftains. So what happens is all the power gets concentrated into just a few hands of the big chieftains and this is about the mid to late 12th century and what happens is they're so competitive with each other they're all struggling to be king, I guess you would say, or <laughs> chief Godi. And, and so uh, <coughs> you have this period of, of um, instability when they're all struggling with each other uh, from the um, 1220s to the 1260s. That's not the 12th century, that's the 13th century. Okay. I wonder if he's made a mistake there. He's really saying the 13th century when, when that is going on um, here. Okay, so, so we've got the main society sort of set up. How did it change over time and how did it evolve? Uh, and that's kind of what we're going to look at for, for a few minutes here as we look at this society. Christianity came uh, quite early in the Viking, in the history of Iceland, and it's it's the only um, conversion to Christianity that I know of in which the legislator voted to convert to Christianity. And so that's what exactly what happened. Here's a description of of how it it voted. The first missionary was German was the German Thangbrand. He was the first one to come. And he was a German missionary. <clears throat> he arrived in Iceland. He was a muscular Christian after the fashion of Agino at Skara and the Englishman Wolfred at Uppsala. He baptized a few of the leading men, took quarrels on his hands, was lampooned, and then killed two or three of his enemies. And then he went back to Germany. Okay, so he was a pretty rough and ready Christian. Then a second mission followed. Uh, by a priest called Thormond, who was an Englishman. He was from England, and uh, maybe even from the Dana Law, which would, uh, and, and we'll, we'll see what the Dana Law is later. That's the area of Danish settlement. And uh, 
so this, he is the one who led to a confrontation at the all thing between a minority of Christians, including at least three Godar, and a substantial majority of heathens. Both sides swore that they would not live together under the same law, and catastrophe seemed imminent. imminent. Then the Christians requested Hall of Sida that he should proclaim that law which was right and proper for Christians. So what they did was appeal to the law speaker and ask the law speaker, okay, tell us what law was right and proper for Christians. But he got out of this in that he made payment to Thorgir, the law speaker, that he should proclaim the law. It's the law speaker who's going to decide even though he was still a heathen. And later, when men had returned to their booths, Thorgir lay down and spread his cloak over him and lay quiet all that day and the night following and spoke never a word. But the next morning he sat up and announced that men should proceed to the law rock, and once men had made their way there, he began his speech. It would be disastrous, he told them, if men should not have one and the same law, all of them, in this land. He thought it policy that they should not let those prevail who were most anxious to be at each other's throat, but reach a compromise. It will prove true if we break the law in pieces that we break the peace in pieces too. And he so concluded his speech that both sides agreed that all should have one law, which he would proclaim. Thorgir's verdict, which must have been a surprise to the heathens, was that all men in Iceland should be baptized in water, cold or warm, and become Christians. A, through, a few relics of heathendom were to let stand. Infants might still be exposed. Horse flesh might still be eaten. Sacrifice might still be carried out in secret. A few years later, these survivors were abolished too. Okay, uh, so um, the colonization date was 870, so 870 is the beginning. So Iceland in the year 1000 now voted at the legislature to convert to Christianity because they said, in Thorgir the lawgiver said, the law speaker said that everyone should live under the same law. And I, I don't know exactly why he decided that, that it should be Christian, that they should all be Christian, maybe he thought the heathens were more tolerant, or the pagans were more tolerant than the Christians were. At any rate, that's the conversion. Uh, immediately, you, you then have some priests, um, uh, Icelandic priests, who were the three Christians who were already there. The priests introduced Roman script to Iceland, and after one generation, the na a native priest emerged. Um, the most famous of the priests in Iceland was Islif, the son of the chieftain Gizr the White. And Gizr was one of the first uh, Godar to accept baptism at Thangbrand's hands. Islif became Iceland's first native bishop, uh, Islif the son of Gizr, in, from 1030 to 1080. And he was 1050 to 1080, and he was succeeded by his son Gizer, Islif's son. Uh, they introduced Christian practices of tithes, charity, and they carried out the first census. They also established two bishoprics in Iceland: one at Skalholt in the southwest, and one at Holar in the north. And they committed the law of Iceland to writing. And this is my guess as to why the the law speaker picked Christianity and the Christians to come is because they would get writing, and writing was such an enormous gift and, and, and advance. Uh, Simon the Learned from 1056 to 1133 and Ari Thorgelson the Learned from 1067 to 1148 were Iceland's first historians. Simon wrote in Latin, which he would have, which he would have uh, learned from the priest, but Ari wrote in Icelandic, so they adapted the alphabet very quickly. And let me go back to this map, and I'll show you where the two bishoprics are. I'm sorry I didn't have a map right there, immediately there. Okay, where's a map? Oh, there, there's a map. Okay, I can show you where they are. 
Um, the bishoprics are now I can here is Skalholt and here is Holar 1106 which is a hundred or uh, 50 years later Holar was founded in 1106 Skalholt was founded in 1056 and so we can see where <laughs> the bishoprics are not very many bishoprics for for all of Iceland okay um, Kolskeg the Learned, who died before 1130, was also a historian. In the 13th century, we have the classical age of the saga, and 120 sagas and short stories were written uh, in all. And these include the family sagas. In fact, most of them were family sagas. They were both more and less than history. They were much embellished, although they did deal with historical events, but sometimes they embellished them to, in order to tell a good story. But poetry was a national industry during the saga age, and you can see one of the developments that they got from the writing. It's also, I mean, because they had the writing, they could then write down all of these oral stories that so many of the storytellers and the scalds had been just telling, and the law speaker had been telling. And so now you see a kind of literature that is associated only with Ireland. It's also been speculated that uh, the Irish influence was also something that, that um, uh, contributed to the development of the saga tradition in Iceland. But we have to remember that sagas were also written in Norway and Sweden and Denmark, so it's, they're not only written in Iceland. Um, they're both more and less than history. They rested on a foundation of history, but the facts were manipulated to tell a good story, and poetry was a national industry during the saga age. Eil Skallagrimsson was supposed to have been the greatest of all skaldic poets from 910 to 990. So the writing of poetry and the saga were their greatest achievement. What then, and, and this is, I, I didn't intend this to be the halfway point, I intended to start a little bit later, but this is sort of starting with our second section. What then was Iceland, okay? I've given you a lot of information that I've, I've gleaned from Gwyn Jones and, and some from Jesse Bayek, but I want to sort of give you Jesse Bayek's major conclusions here. Briefly, he says that Iceland was a society whose development was determined by the dynamics of his, its immigrant <laughs> experience. It's a frontier society and it's completely shaped by being a frontier society and that all these people are immigrants to the area. Now, one thing that, that bothers me a little bit about this theory is it's very fashionable in terms of the way people are writing history right now, that this seems like a popular and fashionable kind of thing to talk about. Um, one of the interesting things is that the central focus in Iceland was law, and far more to a far greater extent than we see in Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, because back in the homeland, all the emphasis is shifting to the kingship and the building of a state. And so they're not, the, the law is still there, but it's not central as it is in Iceland. So this is what is different. And the social order evolved in Iceland, and, and it changed over time. And, and I, want, I want to sort of look at how it changed over time right now. Uh, the social order that evolved in Iceland avoided the establishment of official hierarchies without going so far as to create egalitarianism. Okay, we, we, we really only have kind of two layers. Slavery disappeared quickly. You have the Godi and you have their dependents. You have two layers in this society. And the Godi are richer than the others, but nobody is very wealthy. And, and the gap between them is not that great. Okay, society completely evolved. And I want to read you um, a little passage from Njal's saga. And, and, and this is how Njal's saga opens. This is the opening vignette in Njal's saga. And tell me what you discern here as we read it. 
There was a man named Mord. He was called the Fiddle. He was the son of Sigvat the Red, and he lived at Vol in the Rang River Plains. And this is in Iceland. He was a powerful chieftain and a great lawyer, so great a lawman that no case was thought to be legally judged until he took part. Okay. And the story goes on to tell all of all his adventures at the law courts and what a great lawman he was and all the major cases that he participated in. Does this surprise you? No? He's a Viking. Okay. He's an Icelander. He's a hero. He's being described as a hero in the saga. What are his heroic deeds that they're praising? <laughs> Pretty surprising, huh? <laughs> His law, his, his, he's a lawyer, he's a lawyer. Now we tend to sort of look down on lawyers, we don't like them very much. <laughs> but he's a lawyer. This is the hero, this is the new hero in Iceland. Warriors are gone. They evolve away, from, away, and I have some pictures here to show you that. They evolve away from warlike men. Here is an early Viking, the kind of Vikings, the, the Viking or Makil, the, the guys who were outlawed because they were murderers and they were the ones who discovered Iceland. And so we have these just savage guys who discovered it. And then here we have Viking soldiers who colonized Iceland. And then, lo and behold, they all turned into lawyers. And so Iceland is a whole community of lawyers. And this is what Jesse Bayek is arguing. And this is how they kept from killing each other, because it's a warrior society. And if they had remained warriors, they would have murdered each other in blood feuds. And so instead, they took something that they already had, which was a code of laws that they got from their homeland, and they developed this code of laws to the extent that they could live with each other without killing each other off. And so, and so when there was a, they didn't have blood feuds anymore because they would take their cases to court and the Godi would argue the case at court and then the, his man that, who, who was having the Godi argue his case would accept the decision of the jurymen and so they wouldn't have feuds. I mean, they did have a few feuds. I mean, you can't avoid a few feuds. And certainly in the last period that Jesse Bach talks about, the period of the big chieftains, they did have major feuds in that age. But in the period that he outlines of stability, everything was kept in balance because of the reciprocal agreements that people had with each other, reciprocal rights and responsibilities and respect for the law. And it kept it kept the democracy going for 300 years. It worked. It worked. Let's hope ours works for 300 years, right? <laughs> so here is Iceland, a land of law, where law determines everything. And here is, um, again, it's a land of small settlements. It's no cities anywhere in Iceland, and here are the little uh, rural settlements, se settlements that everybody lived in, a rural complex of buildings like this. This is Mel and Midford. Well, here they are. Here's, this is not, this is a little house over here. And there's one over there, okay. A free man's place in Iceland was defined not by hierarchical ranking, but rather by alliances with individual chieftains. It was internal disorders that actually brought the end of the free state from 1230 to 1260, when it happened that there was an unprecedented accumulation of power and wealth in the hands of a small number of chieftains. And so what happened was people got greedy, chieftains gathered more power to themselves, and they fought each other and weakened Iceland so much that the king took over. And that's what happened in 1260. The King of Norway said, okay, you guys are fighting with each other. I'm taking over. Yeah, question. It seems to me that you can relate a lot of this to feudalism. 
good. I'm so glad you saw that. Yes, you can relate it to feudalism. It's very reminiscent of feudalism. Well, what are the elements here that you see that remind you of feudalism? I guess you've got the two distinct, well, you said in this case they're not as distinct as would be feudal lords and the, the people that are working on their properties, but um, there was feudal law and uh, the lords kind of had interconnections amongst themselves to gain more property. Okay. And and rank through alliance, and, and you do have that sort of lord and and dependent relationship that reminds you, and the reciprocal agreements where each has responsibilities to the others reminds me a lot of feudalism too, and and I think they developed it independently in a different way than Europe did, than the continent did in Europe, uh, but from the same formative institutions that. Um, and and I, I think that relationship is there. I think you're very perceptive to see that. And so feudalism could uh, uh, devolve into struggles, power struggles between people, but it also could work to become a form of government. Um, and uh, in, in England especially, you see a quite similar, as Lay also pointed out, that um, the House of Lords, uh, developed in England, uh, and this happened very early. And my own personal opinion is that Parliament and the, the the baronial council in England, which eventually grew into the House of Lords, and uh, all of those things are feudal in in origin. And that, so that you do see these representative institutions later in England, growing out of the same institutions that the Icelandic institutions. Um, grow from, I, I mean, in that same kind of society. So that's really interesting. Um, historians, even those interested in social history, have tended to avoid using the family sagas, but saga stories reveal the normative codes of the society and indicate to the reader basic rules of conduct. Um, and I think you can kind of see that in, in the sagas. I mean, they describe the behavior of people and the customs of the land. They're not folk tales. They're not epics, romances, or chronicles. Some of them might be romances a little bit, but, but, but they're not any of those things purely. They're mostly realistic stories about everyday issues. And the little one I read you, um, you could see the sort of everyday issues that, that even though it was at the king's court, it was dealing with everyday things um, that confronted the Icelandic farmers and their chieftains. And it's even more true with the ones that are actually set in Iceland, that they're daily issues like they might be fighting over somebody stole the sheep uh, from his pasture, or, or they may be fighting over a farm implement or something. Uh, or quarreling, and then they go to the uh, and they go to the local thing, and they and the goatee speaks for them, and it, it's argued at court, and they settle the disputes. It's dispute settlement, the same as courts are today. Here is another uh, another view of the farmers working in the field. If you can see that it's it's a land of farmers. It's uh, and they're they don't live in cities. Now today they do, but they didn't in in the origin of the settlement. Honor and competition are the two themes that emerge, and that should remind you of feudalism as well. Remember, there's an honor system in feudalism that people behave because they want to preserve their honor, and, uh, and, and this happens in Iceland, but they're also very, very competitive. You know, something similar to this, since you brought it up, also happens on the continent in England as well. And I, I know England, and I think it happens in France as well, and in Germany, but um, I, I happen to know England a little better than I know France and Germany. And what happens in England and the Anglo-Norman state is, in fact, that the, the knights who would, and the barons who would have, in, in a couple of generations earlier, been out fighting battles on their horses, turn their scope of activity into the government. As the government is growing more complex and more complicated in England, men make their career in government service. And that's re it replaces 
the service in the army that they would have done to the feudal lord. So a similar kind of transformation does take place in England, at least. Well, history is more than just the compilation of facts, and the sagas are far from fantasy. We learn how chieftains and their thingmen functioned in their community and maintained power and status within a decentralized society. And so this is, I mean, this is so unusual that you could even have any evidence at all for a decentralized society that, that isn't writing real history. Um, and there were no dangerous predatory animals in Iceland, as we already saw. Uh, and so, um, you know, the men didn't have to fight. They didn't have to protect themselves from animals. They didn't, have, they didn't fight among themselves. And so it was really a peaceful kind of society. Icelandic sources speak of many chieftains in the early centuries. And, and so you have lots of people who come to be independent and come to be free uh, in Iceland to escape the control of kings. Here is Bordieri on um, uh, Rutafjord. This is in the northern settlement. And I've taken these pictures from a, um, a, a 19th century book, uh, translation of Cormac Saga, which takes place in the northern part of, of Iceland. And it's actually in the western province. And here are the little houses. And I should have printed out that picture. I have a picture of a house. I took a picture of a house in Denmark that still looks like that. It, it's sort of stucco with a thatched roof. And that's what these houses are. And, and they still have thatched roofs in Denmark in some of the houses, by the way. And so this is what they would have had in the Icelandic houses in the settlement. That's clearly a thatched roof. Okay, And, and here it would be the sheep, of course, that they would raise. The historical sources relevant to the study of early Iceland fall into several categories. Histories and genealogies, legal compilations, annals, diplomatic collections, and church writings. And so uh, the legal compilations would be law codes. Uh, the diplomatic collections would be um, documents of, of having to do with foreign policy or diplomacy. But there wasn't much of that, actually. They were written in West Norse, a language shared by Iceland and Norway from the 12th to the mid-14th century. And uh, West Norse was an outgrowth of the Donks Tunga, the common language spoken by all Scandinavians at the time of Iceland's settlement. Sources for Icelandic history. Is anybody doing their, their uh, term paper on Iceland? I hope somebody is. Nobody's doing it on Iceland? OK. Anybody doing it to do with Iceland? No? Okay. I wonder what you're doing your papers on. <laughs> All right. Well, if you were doing your term paper on Iceland, maybe some of our distance learning students are doing it on Iceland. Um, here are some of the sources for Iceland. The Icelandingabok, the Landnamabok, uh, the Diplomatarium Icelandicum, the Bishop Sagas. There are actually sagas written about the bishops, which is interesting as well. They've newly been translated, by the way, by an Icelandic woman I met at a conference a couple years ago, which is interesting. The Bishop Sagas were written quite late. They were written in the 13th century. Uh, the Hungervaka, and I'm not sure what that is. Uh, the Gragas, which is the free state laws. Gragas means gray goose, and nobody knows why the free state laws are named gray goose. Uh, the Karangsbok, which is the king's book. Uh, the Stadarholsbok, another law book, and, and these are both private law books. The Vislodi, which is the first law book, now lost. And then the old Christian laws and the new Christian laws. Outlawry and fines were the primary penalties under the laws of the free state, and what they were was an efficient means of removing troublemakers. Uh, and, and in a society that's basically very poor, a fine is, a, is an important kind of punishment that would make people really suffer if they had to pay a fine. Outlawry is even worse because all their property is confiscated and, the, and they're, then they can be killed with impunity by anyone unless they leave the country. They're outside the law and the law doesn't apply to them anymore. 
Jesse Bayek says, the sagas differ from all other heroic literature in the larger proportion that they give to the meanness of reality. Okay, what does that mean? What does that statement mean? Any, any guesses on that? What is the meanness of reality? Normalcy, maybe normalcy, the ordinariness is what he means. He means the ordinariness of reality. And, and, and these are stories about ordinary life. They're so unique. I mean, you just don't find anything like that anywhere in Europe. The family sagas, according to Jesse Bach, have no close parallels in other medieval European narratives. However, he's wrong, actually, because this is not true. In Normandy, which of course is a Viking colony, there are about 30 or more extant uh, family histories, one of which I translated for um, some work I was doing, and, and it, it is amazingly similar to uh, some of the Viking sagas. Um, it has to do with uh, one of the families that um, uh, is associated, I, I showed you my book last week, um, uh, St. Anselm and the Handmaidens of God. St. Anselm was abbot of the uh, monastery of Beck in Normandy, and there were about four major families who were major donors and patrons and supporters of Beck, and one of these families had a family history written about them, and um, uh, the great heroic act in the end, I mean, the, the Virgin Mary appears to the holiest one who wins a victory in war, and then they all give up their arms and they, and they enter the monastery. And so that's how the saga has changed in the Normans. But it's a family history, and it tells the history of the whole family. It, it's so reminiscent of Viking families. Uh, and there are a lot of them. I, that's the only one I happen to have worked with, but there are about 30 in, in, uh, in Normandy in different sources. Um, and, and so, I mean, but they're hard to find because they're very short and they're very scattered around. So Iceland isn't the only place and it's, it's, not, um, it, it's not a coincidence that Normandy was, uh, grew out of a Viking colony. Feud served as a cohesive and stabilizing course, force in old Icelandic society, but what they did, what they used the law codes were for rules of feuding that regulated conflict and limited the breakdown of order. Violence was kept within acceptable bounds. And so if you had a feud, if you paid a major fine, or if somebody happened to be killed, uh, you, you would pay a fine rather than, uh, it, it's kind of like the old Germanic laws where you pay a geld. It almost reminds you of that. Uh, feud did, uh, did break out, and so they controlled it by using the law as a way to regulate it. Now, again, to make that comparison with Normandy, which is interesting, there are periods in Norman history where they had major and very destructive feuds. Every time one of the Dukes of Normandy dies, all the families rise up and they start to kill each other and grab each other's land. And that happens about three times in Norman history until William the Conqueror really brings that whole society under control. But it's not even under control then because you have William the Conqueror who then conquers England and then uh, his sons uh, both inherit parts of the Anglo-Norman state and they fight each other. But this is not a feud between the great men, it's between the two king's son. When you do have the feud between the great men that breaks out again, it's in Stephen's reign, uh, who, who grabbed the throne when uh, Henry I died without a son and, and tried to leave it to his daughter. His nephew Stephen grabbed the throne, and then H Henry's daughter, Matilda, or Maud, fought a civil war with Stephen, and that's the point where you see this breakdown of order and feuds again, where all the barons then start fighting each other and grabbing each other's land. I mean, you see that kind of repeated. And of course, England 
we're, we're going to talk about England soon, but England is extremely Viking, just as Normandy is, because there were so many Viking settlers there, so many Scandinavian settlers. But so, so this element of feud appears in all the Viking societies, not just Iceland. In 1140 to 1180, we have the first grammatical treatise. The sagas are based on dispute resolution, which is an indigenous development. And here, here again, uh, um, uh, I have to argue with Jesse and say that, uh, that you do see some of this in England and Normandy as well. It's not only in Iceland. But the sagas reveal social behavior and social patterning. We see an evolution of a new society with no king and only law. Uh, and then his thesis is that the effect of emigrating from Europe is to form a frontier society. But this frontier society is unique because there are no natives. And so they're freed of the need to cluster. They don't have to cluster together in towns. They don't have to build castles. They don't have to build, uh, uh, what are those walls that are palisades around the city or walls around the, the because there are no enemies in Iceland. And so they are freed of the need to cluster. They don't form any cities. They live out in the countryside. They don't have to have fences for their, their cattle. Uh, he also has the concept of a fragment of fragment societies because the law took precedence over kinship and you have the all thing that where the law is pronounced for the whole land with the logretta the lawmaking body and the four quarters where you have the var thing which is the springtime thing and the lead the fall assembly uh, you you have a lawberg in each of the uh, in each of the thing meeting places, uh, and I showed you the Thor rock. I think I have it again. You have lawmen who are legal experts or lawyers. They're lawyers, and you can can you see the can you see the um, the pronunciation lawmen. It makes you think of English or lawyer. Uh, it comes down to us in English. So here is the thorn Thor's Nest thing, which is the local thing in the western quarter, and we pointed that out. I think this is the Thor. Uh, this is the Thor um, rock here, and Helgafell is in the background here. Um, and here is the Thor stone, where th which would be the focus of the law. Well, sources of the chief, chieftain's wealth consisted of sources of income available only to the chieftains. Gizer Islifsson carried out a census at the end of the 11th century, and he then counted 4,560 substantial farmers. Okay, these would be the, go, the, go, the Godar. So there would be 4,560 4, Godar. And each of them would have a number of retainers. So we can get an idea of, of what the population of Iceland was. Yeah. Uh -huh. It seems to me possibly the reason for the ability to spread out was just because no one would want to come and exploit the ability to tax the people. Nobody would want to exploit the ability to attack I mean, the people. If, if you yeah. have no resources, why would someone from some foreign land want to come attack you? Oh, right. <laughs> well, the king of Norway coveted Iceland from the beginning, but, but he, he wasn't able to take it over until they sort of disintegrated into civil war. I think it was a power thing with the uh, king of Norway. It's not that Iceland was wealthy. It was just that he wanted, the, you know, to have an empire. Um, and to govern more things. Uh, uh, there was a thing tax and a temple tax, but they would be very minor. I mean, you know, this, this is not a wealthy land, and so no one would want to conquer them. Uh, the Godar also had the right to set prices for foreign goods, but still, you know, trade sort of fell off pretty quickly. Uh, because why would trade fall off in Iceland? I mean, can you think of any reasons why trade did not grow in Iceland? Um, they didn't have anything that people couldn't get anywhere else. They didn't have anything unique except those one furry, one thing, those furry coat kind of things. 
fringy coats or whatever they were. Uh, they didn't have anything anybody particularly wanted. And they didn't have enough money <laughs> to buy very much from anybody else. Yeah. Possibly also because it was on the fringe of known society and it wasn't on the trade route. It wasn't on the trade route. It was on the fringes of, of society, and, and no major trading passed through there. No major trading made its way to Iceland because they didn't have anything to sell, and they didn't have money to buy anything. So, I mean, you know. And that may have been why the democracy succeeded, because they were left alone. That's, that's something we can think about, too, that the democracy succeeded because nobody bothered them because they didn't have anything they wanted. <laughs> Um, uh, the the Godar the Godar really had control of everything. They they controlled the thing tax and the temple tax, and they had the right to set prices for foreign goods, and they managed the courts of confiscation. There were also sources of income available to all freemen, and this would be trade and the rental of land to tenant farmers. And this is what happened to slavery because they could make more money renting the land to tenant farmers. They gave up their slaves in order to rent the land and get that income. And so that's what happened to slavery. The slaves all became tenant farmers. And so then they all became equal with the other dependents of the, of the um, Godar. Uh, the tithe and the stadir, which are uh, types of taxes, uh, they could collect. But the tithes were divided in four parts, the bishop, the priest, the church, and the poor. So, you know, by, by this time, it's minuscule. Did you have a comment? I'm just wondering if possibly the rental of land to tenant farmers led to indentured servants. It didn't. It, it, but a person could be enslaved for, for debt. And, and that's true, that that could happen, but it didn't happen in a widespread way. Uh, so that there was never, never a class of, of slaves or indentured servants restored because their labor on the land, I don't, I don't know, it just, it doesn't appear, it doesn't, it didn't develop that way. They all sort of remained equal. The church co owners would collect one fourth of the tithe, and so then the tithes were were um, again divided into four parts. And so you're talking about practically nothing as far as the tax is concerned. There were also tolls or dues from churchgoers who would have to have to pay um, a toll. And here is uh, a here is a, a settlement, or it's not a settlement; it's a farm. All of these are farms, and this particular farm has a church because can you see the little cross there on the church? See that cross on the church, and and again it has a thatched roof. Um, and remember that the timber was all gone, and so all the churches have to be made out of mud or brick or stucco or turf. Uh, all the houses have to be made of that because the timber was gone so fast. So this would have been a little church uh, that would have been on the Godi's farm, and then everybody from all around would come to the little church. Here's even a tiny little cemetery with one cross in it. This is a picture of a church in Denmark that, that I, I, from what I'm looking at in these drawings, I would think these, uh, the churches would look something like this, this ruin in, in Iceland. I had another picture. I think I didn't bring it. I had another picture of a Danish church. Well, no merchant class arose. And again, for the same reason that trade didn't arise, that's why there wasn't a merchant class. Exports were mostly woolen goods, and that would be the fringe coats manufactured by women. Uh, they didn't even knit yet. And remember we talked about, when, when we talked about the women's work about knitting, and uh, uh, apparently knitting wasn't really widespread until like the 14th or 15th century, so you couldn't even buy those beautiful Icelandic sweaters until the Middle Ages was over. Well, there was lack of wood to build large ships because Iceland was quickly deforested, and this also mitigated against trade because they couldn't build any ships and they were limited to what ships they already had. So rental land became very important, and slavery diminished rapidly, and it changed, as I said, to extensive tenant farming. Thus, possession of the land became the major source of wealth. 
And here is a Saxon ox plow, and I thought um, uh, this might well be similar to um, uh, what was used in Iceland. I, I mentioned before that there, some historians suspect that uh, the Vikings uh, were the ones who spread this heavy plow everywhere in Europe, and so and so they might well have used a plow like this to to sow their crops. But they were much more pastoral. I mean, they didn't they, they farmed some, but the major livelihood was herding animals, sheep and cattle, and mostly sheep, and then hunting and gathering and fishing and, and, and um, uh, hunting whales and, and hunting whatever small animals and seals and fishing. And so that would have been the same as in Norway, from their home in Norway. They had a consensual government. Uh, advocacy became part of a highly stylized way of handling disputes, and they used compensation, arbitration, and compromise. And the Godi acted as the spokesman for his dependents. Um, and here I suggested, uh, and this is my suggestion, not Jesse Biox, that it's not unlike the Roman system of the patrons and the clients, which I suggested to you before. The church was integrated into Icelandic society, and what is really interesting as you watch the history of Iceland as it develops is Christianity became more Icelandic. Iceland didn't become more Christian. <laughs> the church had to adapt to the culture of Iceland. The Icelanders did not adapt very much to Christianity. I mean, they <laughs> built churches, they went to mass, they gave lip, lip service, but you go to Iceland today and they'll tell you about the elves and the gnomes and the dwarves who still inhabit all of Iceland. And there, in fact, there was an effort to revive the pagan religion about five years ago in Iceland. It didn't succeed, but the, the fact that they, you know, they still had the knowledge, they still had all the ingredients are still there in Iceland. I showed you that picture. I should have brought that picture again. I had the Spring of St. John, which was a, you know, a Viking uh, um, shrine, a, a pagan shrine that, the, that was located at the little brook and spring, a natural spring, and they just named it, you know, after St. John because... Um, it converted to Christianity as well, but the spring was still a holy object as it had been under paganism. So Christianity had to adapt a lot more than Iceland society adapted. Uh, in fact, the bishops had to function with this arbitration and with the compensation and compromise just as much as all the other great men did in Iceland and far more than the church did on the continent. You don't have the pope rising up and battling the, the, the government in Iceland as you did in, on the continent in Europe. The farmers under duress were a lucrative form of wealth, and again, more from rents. But again, uh, Jesse Bayak is writing internally in Iceland. He's not comparing. Um, he's not comparing Iceland to Europe. He's comparing Icelanders to Icelanders when he's saying lucrative wealth, because lucrative wealth is very relative there. Iceland, in fact, remained largely isolated from the European world, even when Norway took control in 1230 to 1260. I mean, it just was all was isolated. Everybody pretty much left it alone, and that's one reason it developed the society it did, because uh, there was not a lot of input from other cultures in it. It was much poorer than Europe. And was it essentially a classless society? I mean, could we go so far as to say that there were, I mean, the, that the difference between the classes was insignificant? Would any of you go that far? Or do you think that the two layers is enough to make it a class society? The two layers, I think, are enough because they are, well, they're not separated a lot by wealth. They're definitely distinct. So we can't say it's a really completely egalitarian society, but it might come closer than any other society I've ever seen to being egalitarian. Um, 
any, anyway, at least that's my opinion. So the Godi plus the dependents are the two classes there. In the end, it degenerated into civil wars among the Godi. The leading families were reduced to just a few leading families in control, and this enabled Norway to take it over because they fought among themselves. But ships still went to Vinland until about 1350 uh, to, to um, fish the rich cod fishing grounds, to harvest the timber, because that's where they had to get their timber. They had to sail to Vinland. And, and this is a little known fact, that you still have Norwegian and Icelandic ships and Greenland ships going as late as 1350 to fish the cod banks off of Vinland. In fact, did, did all of you know that Columbus went to Norway to study um, to study navigation? <laughs> and, and so it was known that Vinland was there and harvested timber. But they stopped in 1350. What happened in 1350? What? The plague, the Black Death, happened in 1350. Another thing happened in about 1350, and that was that there was a climate change, and the warm weather, the warmer period that had been before 1350, reverted back to normal, and it was colder than it had been before. And this is about the point when the Greenland colony disappears, which is what we'll talk about next week, when the weather got a bit colder. So those two events happened in 1350. Well, why don't we, why don't we sort of reassess? We have uh, some time left at the end. And maybe I, we can look at these questions and see if any of them intrigue you and if you formed any ideas. What was unique about Iceland? Why do you think it developed as it is, as it did? And what do you think of the concept of a frontier society? Do any of those questions sort of spark ideas among any of you? Of you? Is it a frontier society? What do you think about Jesse Biok's concept that this, this is really a frontier society, the, the fact that it was a frontier society shaped the way it was? You, do, does that make sense to you? It does. Okay. What do you think? Just going off the theme, I guess, of America's frontier west, I think a major element of being a frontier in society is having interaction with, as you said earlier, with native peoples. And yeah, yeah it was a native, or it was a frontier society, but it was a frontier society that was completely homogenous of one people. It's completely homogenous. Yes, that's one. That's one thing about it is it's completely homogenous. It's not interacting with any other society that we know of, except maybe the Irish. Though, what about that? What do you think about that? Yeah. I think one thing you think of in a frontier society is kind of at first it's lawless and things like that, but they were really dependent upon the law. And it evolved as an island does, without a lot of interaction from other people. As a frontier, would continue to get influxes of new people at all times. That's that's an interesting point too. Yeah. I mean, you might think more like the Hawaiian Islands, which remained quite isolated and and you know and. Um, homogenous in the same way that Iceland did. That's, that's an interesting concept. So, so the frontier society kind of works, but not exactly. Not exactly. It doesn't work the way the American frontier worked. Um, the other frontier that I might compare it to uh, uh, would be like the German frontier in, in the Middle Ages. Uh, medieval society was a frontier society that spread eastward and, and the German frontier against the Slavs was that frontier that, and, and they fought crusades there in that area. But again they had enemies to fight against and they were clearing land but they were pushing other people out. Um, uh, and, and that's not happening here. Uh, well, what about his, his concept of it being an immigrant society? He says everybody was an immigrant to Iceland. Uh, does that make sense to you?
base as the homeland. They have the same base as the homeland. Yeah. Everybody has a common culture, pretty much. It's a yeah. Irish, but anyway, it's into some like But the homeland changed drastically at the t at the same time Iceland. It, well, it well Jesse Box says it regressed, but is that true, or did it just go in another direction? I mean, uh, what it do you just think? evolved differently because it kind of became cut off from the rest of Europe and even their actual homeland. Yeah. And after a certain point, you know, the Vikings weren't out of picking anymore, so they were just kind of left their own boxes. Yeah. And they weren't warriors anymore. They were farmers. They were lawyers. <laughs> well, this is a whole colony of lawyers. Um, well, then if, if you agree to that, then the alternative concept that I proposed doesn't work either, that Iceland represented what Scandinavia would have become without European influences. Does that work? What do you think? Values uh, than most Vikings do. I mean, warfare is, well, of course, it's always important. It doesn't seem like that. that's the highest point. Maybe more charisma and things associated with lawyers. And, and the writing, obviously, was important, much more important than the other Viking societies. So yes. I don't think it was really a fair uh, comparison between the two because they have totally different uh, histories. Right, and, and so they have totally different histories, and so they would have evolved. Well, what, what if Scandinavia had remained isolated? And I mean, that was sort of what I was thinking. If Scandinavia had remained isolated, would it have ended up the same way as Iceland? What do you think? Well, in order to do that, you'd have to eliminate speaking completely. You'd have to eliminate speaking, right. and they wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of seems that they were um, isolated out of necessity more than choosing that. Point. I mean, they ran out of trees, so they couldn't build any more boats. Yeah. Whereas, um, if they maybe had the opportunity, then it would have been more like the other uh, five societies, perhaps. But they didn't have any, anything to trade. I mean, I mean, they were a subsistence society. They they produced just enough to live on. They didn't really have surpluses to trade. Yes. Yeah. Once again, be a push then for more picking, <laughs> which is exactly what didn't happen. It didn't like, happen. It seems like there's didn't a slight happen. paradox there. If they yeah. didn't have any uh, commodities to trade, then we should go uh, more Viking options. Oh, but you know what pops into my mind? Instead of going vic Viking, I think they went lawyering. Because isn't lawyering wars with words? I think that exactly. And I also think because, you know, how they admired Odin was admired for what? Ah, trickery. <laughs> <laughs> Knowledge and wisdom. Okay. <laughs> Knowledge, yeah. wisdom. And the Vikings loved to outwit people. I mean, they, they were perfect natural lawyers. <laughs> they loved to outwit and outsmart people. I was going to say, uh, a lot of lawyer stuff, um, it's kind of like playing the word game so much. Yes. You know, it attaches to a law or how does this work? In favor or not in favor. But that's the job of a lawyer is to argue the best case for his client. And and, and so, I mean, tricks are good and um, appealing to emotions. Anything, anything that wins, the point of a lawyer is winning. And so this competition that you might have associated with war at an earlier time gets channeled into the courts which is kind of neat. <laughs> I mean, isn't that a really civilized thing to do? To stop fighting and killing each other and adjudicate? <laughs> kind of. Yeah, well, that's kind of fun. Well, what about what about Irish influence? Any any thoughts on the Irish influence that might oh, be here? I Big influence. Okay, their, their, their influence was there, but I think it was very limited. What do you think? Well, I don't think it's necessarily an Irish influence, but I thought it was kind of an odd parallel. Huh? Because before the Vikings came to Ireland, there were no cities, and it was basically just settlements. And then I noticed in Iceland, it was the same way. There were no yeah. cities, there was just settlements. 
But so was early, early Norway uh, was also like that before, before they, they really, you know, had all that European influence and started Viking, yeah. And we tried an analogy that might not be exactly parallel, but the Irish came to America and were very based in the law. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Because of course there was a huge Viking influence in, in um, Ireland and in England as well, which is a very law-conscious society, a very civil society. Um, can you think of any other impact that the Irish slaves might have had on the society? Christianity. I mean, wasn't that a big... Didn't they bring Christianity to us? Um, Probably, uh, well, the priests, of course, who had been, in, had been there before the Vikings came, they left because the point of going to uh, Iceland was to be alone and to be a hermit. <laughs> and once the Icelanders came, the Irish priests left. The Irish who were there were slaves who were brought, yeah. And the slaves, uh, um, but the slavery disappeared. And so the Irish slaves quickly became equal to the dependents, and they were like tenant farmers. And then they intermarried, and so they, um, now, now this is another theory that's also proposed, that, um, that if the Irish slaves hadn't been there, that the, that the Scandinavian society of the Icelanders would have been very inbred, and that it was the genes of the Irish that added to the um, uh, unique mix of iron, expanded the gene pool. What do, what do you all think about that theory? What do you think about that? Well, it seems like there were, I mean, I don't know how the Irish there were, but it seems like there were quite a few um, Norwegians there already. I mean, if there were 4,000 uh, Gobi, yeah. I can't imagine how many people on the internet that many people. Well, I think, I think the figure I recall is one-seventh of them were Irish slaves. Yeah, one-seventh. And, and so the theory goes that they increased the gene pool and made Iceland a more viable society. Um, what do you all think about that theory? And any, any flaws in that logic? I can think of one that, that occurs to me that what what do you think? Well, a lot of Ireland was based out of Viking I guess the same Viking gene pool from before. Oh but good point. Yeah. Yeah. There was already a lot of Irish and, and Norse intermarriage. Yeah, remember the remember the um, what were they called? The um, foreign Irish who converted to Thor? <laughs> the Vikings got there. Yeah, there's already a lot of inter intermarriage going on in uh, Ireland. That one, that one didn't occur to me. I didn't think of that one. Uh, what, what, what seemed to me that one could argue against that theory is, sure, you, you have the Irish gene pool in there among the settlers. The one-seventh of the settlers are Irish. But once they're all there, the gene pool stays the same for 300 years. <laughs> uh, and basically, I mean, it's a pretty small number of people there for 300 years, and you don't have a lot of intermarriage uh, after the settlement period is over between the Icelanders who live in Iceland and the people in the Faroes or Norway. Or, I mean, they, they stay pretty isolated. So even with the Irish genes at the beginning, they still would be a fairly isolated society. What do you think? Yeah. Wasn't there still some contact? Wasn't there still some contact? Oh, yeah, there was contact with Norway, but not a lot of intermarriage. Um, as far as I can tell, it's not a lot of intermarriage. And, and then there, uh, once, once Iceland was filled up and all the land was taken, no more colonists came. I, I mean, there would be an individual adventure uh, and, and some of the Icelanders, when, and they, when there was a, um, 
a famine, some of them moved on to Greenland, but, uh, but there was no huge influx of new settlers into Iceland at any given point. So, I mean, it was that gene pool and that was it pretty much for that time. So why do you think Iceland developed the way it was, the way it did? Was it unique, do you think, or not? We thought of, we thought of a couple of parallels. It's kind of like Polynesia, maybe. Polynesian island, like Hawaii. It has some similarities to English society. What do you think? Wouldn't Iceland be novel when compared to England though? It came around the whole, if you want to compare it to feudalism, it came around several hundred years before England really got rooted into feudalism. Yeah, I, but that kind of depends on how you define feudalism. Uh, um, there's, there's an interesting book on um, Anglo-Saxon England by um, um, Richard Abels that basically argues, uh, I mean he doesn't come out and say it, but he puts all the pieces of the puzzle together and it's quite clear that he's <laughs> described a feudal society up to the eve of the Norman conquest that it's already, his argument is essentially that it's already feudal before the Normans get there. Uh, so it depends on how you define feudalism. I mean, because we were saying that, that the Icelanders and, and the Vikings are pretty similar to feudal society. So maybe feudalism grows out of Viking society. What about that for a novel concept? <laughs> or at least is affected by it. What do you think? Mind if I, yeah, it's just a, actually a different question about yeah. that. So I don't want to change the subject too much. But um, it's about conversion to Christianity. I'm kind of wondering why they were less willing to change a lot of the things, that a lot of their customs, whereas other, uh, other nations, Viking nations, not that they changed them all, but they at least seem like a little bit more willing to change that. It's not, we talked about how they're isolated, but that doesn't seem like itself to be a full reason uh, for, for that. Do you have any ideas about that, why that might be? Uh, yeah, we're going to have a lecture on the conversion and actually uh, it is interesting because Iceland is very, very different. You only have those two missionaries who go to Iceland and one of them acts pretty Viking by killing people and then goes home and the other one converts a couple of people who then convince the legislature to vote to convert to Christianity is the only time in the whole world that the legislature votes to convert to Christianity. And in fact, the conversion of the other Scandinavian countries was quite difficult because in, in all the cases, the king tried to force it on the people and the people rebelled and the king had to back away and restore paganism. Uh, the conversion came late and and, and difficultly to Scandinavia. The people did not really want to convert that much. I mean, it had to be forced on them, essentially. So Iceland was different. Why do you think? Why do you think Iceland might have been so unique in this? It just seems that Iceland is, okay, they're choosing Christianity, obviously, at least voting on it. It seems like they're acting, in fact, independently from Christianity, whereas the um, other nations kind of did it for other reasons. They had some real you know, political and, uh, and economic reasons to convert to Christianity, so the king would have to force it upon the, the people, whereas, I mean, that's a, the dependence then, perhaps, on Christianity. Is, is that a possible uh, truth there at all? I'm that, that kind of makes sense, yeah, it makes sense to me. Um, but well, we can revisit this when we do the conversion period and we look at it and, and, and let's bring it up again and see if we can make this comparison and why it does. Uh, but um, they, they quite consciously, uh, it's, it's the law speaker, Thorgeir, who makes the decision 
he thought very deeply. He covered himself up with his cloak and he meditated and he thought about it and thought about it and then he decided they should all convert to Christianity. But they could go home and they could practice paganism in private. And he, he was a pagan, correct? <laughs> and he was a pagan, yes. And he surprised everybody. But what was the reason he gave? Can you remember the reason he gave for why they should convert to Christianity? So that everybody will be the same, right? Yeah, so that everybody will live under the same law, under the same law, because if they didn't live under the same law, their society would be shattered. So clearly their society meant more to them than their religion. That, uh, that it was more important to them to keep the peace than to keep their religion. Uh, but, but they adopted, I mean, the way he put it in, in the Chronicle I read you, it, it was like, okay, let's adopt this in name only. <laughs> and then let's go home and do what we want in private. Um, even to the even to the uh, point of exposing infants, unwanted infants, which was part of their their custom to do. Uh, I mean, they weren't they weren't giving up a lot of their customs. Only the ritual is what they were giving up, and that's that's the appearance that it, that it gives. But the decision was made that it was more important to keep their society intact than to risk some kind of a rift between it by having two religions there. That was the decision he made. But that's a pretty interesting decision by itself, don't you think? Especially since there was such a large majority of pagans. Yes. And, and the Chronicles distinctly says only three of the, Godi, of the Godar were Christian. And those three brought it before the legislature and wanted to convert everybody. You see how fanatical the Christians were. <gasps> um, that this was, this was what they wanted. I mean, their goal was to convert the whole society, which they did. Um, but... Um, you also see how tolerant the Viking society is. But he made a value judgment. It's more important to keep the peace than to keep our religion. So that's a, it's a very practical decision. Very Viking, actually, <laughs> when you come down to it. Yeah. Well, how, how does how does this Icelandic society fit into the overall picture of Scandinavian history? This is the last we try. Yeah. How would you categorize it as part of the Scandinavian world, the Viking world? Is it typical? Is it atypical? How does it fit into the big picture? <coughs> yeah. It, it seems typical, but it seems mature. It's, you know, they've laid down their, their swords, and now they're settling down, and they're making some laws, which laws typical for Vikings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, homesteads were becoming typical as the times were progressing. Yeah. So you see it as a mature uh, expression of Viking society. That's an interesting concept. Um, yeah. I any other thoughts on, on um, how it fits into the big picture of the Viking world? I've shown you that map so many times of the Viking world. Maybe if, maybe if we look at it again, we can think about how it fits into the Viking world. Oops, except we've got to get it to lay flat there. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
we have the idea that it's, it's, it's maybe an expression of a mature Viking society. And in many ways that works, not only the homesteads, but the evolution of the fighting uh, mentality into the, into the fighting with words of the law and, and a society dominated by law. The homesteads. But it's not in the center, is it? It's on the fringes. Not many people go there. I mean, a, a lot of Icelanders go to, to Norway. Um, there was another saga I was thinking about reading you. It was um, um, Auten's saga, I think was the name of it. And, and um, he went to the court of the king of uh, Norway and bringing a polar bear. And the king of Norway tried to buy it from him. Oh, I want that polar bear. I'll pay you any price for it. And he said, nope. It's, it's a gift for the king of Denmark. And the king of Denmark, of course, was the mortal enemy of the king of D Norway. <laughs> and so he had, he had come with this wonderful polar bear that everywhere wa everyone wanted. Um, and so the Icelanders, the Icelanders travel uh, some. And so they go uh, adventuring by visiting other countries. But, uh, uh, but they don't stay there. They go home to Iceland. And so that kind of argues for the serenity and the and the way Iceland worked together really nicely. Yeah, another, another society that I've been equating with this is a, a, a very early society, early Nile society. They were geographically separated from the rest of the uh, world. Yeah. They didn't. So life was easier. Cultural diffusion didn't happen. But when it did, they get they had a lot of time to digest it and expand uh -huh. on it. And so that, that's one of the societies I've been looking at. That, that, yeah, like Egypt. Yeah. E well, early Egypt. Early, really, early Egypt. early Egypt when it was still very isolated and a very successful society that worked. Very slow, very. For uh, a long time. And, and the people liked it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you all have come up with some really interesting ideas tonight. Good discussion. And next week, we're going to look, we're going to go all over the place. We're going to look at um, Greenland and Vinland, and then we're going to go to Russia. So off a viking again next week. <laughs>